Welcome. Um, first and foremost, I ask you to please make sure your phones are on silent. Yeah, I had to do that to myself. Yeah, make sure my phone was on silent. Um, we are very pleased to have the Rohab Ensemble with us tonight. Um, let me tell you a little bit about the context behind what we're going to be doing. Uh, a lot of you, the core students, who just read the Conference of the Birds in Core, and uh, my students from the Sufi poetry class, who spent a whole month reading Conference of the Birds. Yeah, I'm sure you all know it very closely. Um, there is one. Um, there is one anecdote out of the Conference of the Birds. Um, the whole reason why we have this musical performance is geared towards this particular text. Uh, if you don't know anything about it, let me just tell you very briefly. Yeah, I'm going to tell you Conference of the Birds in a nutshell. Yeah, three minutes. Um, the Conference of the Birds is an allegory of the soul's journey towards God. Uh, it is a group of birds who gather at the beginning, and it is their journey towards the Seymour. The Seymour is this mythical bird, a magic bird from Persian myth. Um, the, the birds represent different human types. They are basically the representation of the human soul on its journey towards the divine. Uh, it is a lovely story. Uh, the story progresses through different stages where the birds, the different souls, kind of uh, put the, the material burdens that the physical self put, puts on them, behind them, in order to uh, go towards this journey towards the divine. Uh, at the very end of the story, 30 birds see more. See is 30, more is... Um, again, more than in modern <laughs> version is the poor, lowly chicken, but in classical usage it is a bird. So 30 birds arrive at the court of the Seymour, and, and they see themselves reflected in this expression of, of ultimate reality, the divine. And they realize that it's been an internal journey all along. The story is um, punctuated by anecdotes. Um, where we are told different stories um, that represent the different stages of the soul. One of the most famous ones out of the story is the story of the moth and the flame. Um, the moth is drawn to the flame irresistibly um, and wants to unite with the flame. So the story of the moth and the flame is a group of moths who are looking at a candle from behind the window, and they send a representative of the moths to go and bring back news of what that flame is. Uh, one moth goes and circles around the flame and comes back and gives his report. It is a completely unsatisfactory report. Uh, another moth goes out, gets closer, comes back, gives his report, it's still unsatisfactory. The final moth that goes embraces the flame and goes up in a ball of flames, and then we are told that that moth is the one who has a true understanding of the nature of the flame. Again, within the allegorical context, it is the experience, uh, that unmediated experience of the soul that encounters the divine. So what we have for you tonight is a musical representation of that. Um, we are going to hear some wonderful classical instruments tonight um, by the Rohab Ensemble, um, punctuated by very little bits and pieces of the actual story of the moth and the flame, both in English, sorry, both in Persian and in English translation. The translation is the one that all the core students and all of my students read. Uh, it is the Dick Davis translation, which, which kind of sings wonderfully. Um, after the performance, um, I, I'll, I'll introduce the members, um, and uh, hopefully if, if you're interested, you can ask questions about the, some of the instruments that chances are you probably haven't seen before. Uh, you will see or hear 
some um, some vocal acrobatics that you probably haven't heard before either. Um, so please, I invite our wonderful friends, the Rohab Ensemble on stage, and we hope you enjoy the story of the moth.
گرم از این فیتابه به شم جمعه می گفتند می باید یکی کو خبر آرد زمت لبن شد یکی پروانه تا قصریز بود در فضا درس یا از شم بازگشت و دفتر خود باز کرد بس به او برقل فهم آباز ناقلی فروداش در جمع گفت او را نیست از شم Moths gathered in a fluttering throng one night to learn the truth about the candle's light. And they decided one of them should go to gather news of the Yusuf. One flew till in the distance he discerned a palace window where a candle burned. And when no near, back again he flew to tell the others what he thought he knew. The mentor of the moths dismissed his way, remarking, He knows nothing.
ای بهش ننوشم به دست صاحبی رزوان مرا به باد چه حاجت مسته بوی تو مجمعی که در آین شاهدان دو عالم از عرب سوی تو دارم غلام روی تو باشم این
We have a large Shiraz contingency here with us tonight. Um, uh, Amin's been involved with, in the classical Persian music scene around Boston for a long time. He's organized a lot of different things around here. Uh, he has his PhD from Boston University in chemistry. <laughs> <laughs> These are the things that are <laughs> um, And he's currently a research fellow at uh, Mass General Hospital and the Harvard Medical School. Um, Muhammad Ali Kaliba uh, on vocals. Um, he learned traditional classical music in Iran, in Tehran. He is currently uh, assistant professor of sociology and international studies at Boston College. Um, <laughs> <laughs> That's right. right. It's hard to get a applause out of them for Boston College. <laughs> um, on the ney, the ney is the is the flute, the reed flute, is Sino Mohsenyan, um, who also learned um, his classical music in Iran in the northern province of Mazandaran. Now, those of you who read the Shahnameh. Mazandaran is, it's a different Mazandaran from where all the thieves live, right? <laughs> in the show on the the thieves are in Mazandaran, right? Um, he, um, he is a graduate student of mechanical engineering at UMass. <laughs> and finally on percussion, the two instruments you see there, uh, it is the, the one that's held on the side is the tombak, and the one uh, with the chain link on the inside is the daf. That's Ashkan Sadi, um, who has also learned to play music in Shiraz. 
right? Um, he has performed in Shiraz in different places, different venues, also the Museum of Fine Arts. Uh, he is a graduate of Boston University. He is a practicing dentist and has his own dental practice in Franklin, Massachusetts. <laughs> accomplished group people if you learn anything is if you're a scientist or whatever it is you do don't give up on your dreams of music and other ones <laughs> yes. um, so and um, if you uh, if you have any questions um, I'm sure you do about the instruments about the musicians please this is the time to ask please feel free to ask about the name? Yeah, how do you like, use the whole mouth thing? Like, is it on your teeth? Yes, it is on your teeth. Actually, it is a very simple hollow tube. Mm -hmm. yeah. There is a plastic mouse beside the top that you need to put it in front of, actually between the front teeth of uh, front teeth. And with teeth and tongue, you need to blow the air into the tube to make the sound. So it is different, if, for example, some other uh, instrument. Yeah, it is very classical, traditional Iranian uh, instrument. It is the same instrument that makes all the high and all the low sounds, right? And it is mostly by the placement of yes. the... Yes, yeah, the speed of the air and the position. John, so the, the playing the, the tombak, yeah. um, there was a sound, it was, it was a hard knocking sound as opposed to the soft drum head, the, the, yeah. the, head, the talking head. Do you do that actually with your thumb? Yeah. No, not actually very with your thumb. It's, it's more like a snap type of scenario. A snap right? on if, the wood? If, if you're talking about this sound, are you talking about Yes. Yeah. So that's more like in a snap. And then in this, in, with this instrument, again, one of the techniques is you kind of go all around with this and obviously use this and they use the top. I mean, the, the melodies that we were playing were kind of uh, quiet and mellow, so... But that really hard knocking sound, right? you that? But yeah. With the snapping. With the snapping on, on the wood. On the wood, yes. Right. On the skin on the wood, yeah. Right. Yeah, to Mohammed, you, uh, your vocals, you were like uh, singing, I think, uh, Can you speak a little bit about what you were, uh, what you were playing? So in Iranian classical music, did you hear two, two forms of it? The, the last, so we did the composed song with the rhythm, and the first part didn't have a rhythm. It has a meter. There's still some order to it. So in that that the, the one without the rhythm we call avos. Avos avos means both any kind of singing, but also this particular genre of singing. Uh, usually, classical poetry uh, is sung through avos. So it's usually sad. is or Rumi Molavi, the main Persian poet. What I was singing was a ghazal, a few verses from a ghazal, uh, from Saadi. And um, like many other Persian poems, it's very melancholic. It's longing for the beloved and uh, <laughs> wanting to sacrifice your life. And all you think about is, uh, is the beloved. <laughs> I just translate the first line. In that uh, breath that I'm dying, I will be thinking about you. I will give my soul with the uh, with the hope that I will be the dust of your alley. So, with the standards of today, it's very intense love. <laughs> <laughs> Another question with the, with the vocals, um, the, 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 the fluttering sort of sound like on all the runs, uh, I guess like what is that technique called and like what are you like doing with your throat to make that sort of, that, that, that soft starting and softening again, it's, you know, it's, it's just like a mystery of like how that works, how you make those sounds. It, the, the name in Farsi is, means is tahrij. Tahrij. It's also a more informal slang word, which is cha cha. <laughs> <laughs> it's also the word we use for the voice of sound of nightingale. But this this technique is a, a specific, particular to Iranian 
music, Iranian vocal, and a big part of learning how to sing Iranian classical music is just to master this technique. The closest thing you might hear about, like yodeling, would be <laughs> or throat singing. Throat. But actually, if you do this tahrir properly, you should not use your throat. Uh, suppose the the sound uh, is supposed to be made through your uh, through your mouth. I, mean, I can tell you yeah. theoretically, but I don't know how much. Maybe. So from the small time, it should be above the small time. I mean, all of it. So that if, if, you, if I do it badly, it would be ha 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 ha. This is the easiest. If you try, this is probably the first, well, the first uh, voice that you can make. But you have to bring it up higher. Oh, 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 oh. So I'm bringing it now in this area. I mean, yeah, I mean, and when you take the class, your teacher says, put your voice here and there. But it's just difficult to, to do it. I remember the first time I did it, I was like, oh my god. I, <laughs> I couldn't do it again. <laughs> so I can add one more thing. I think the this because the voice is used also as an instrument so it's not just to deliver the lyrics and poetry but also uh, to create the musical environment musical mode or change the mode or sometimes there is a difference between the poetic sentence and the musical sentence I might say the poet the, the, the verse from the poetry but the musical sentence is not finished and I use this this technique to finish the or to start a musical sentence. Can you explain the, you were beautiful, by the way, all of you guys, I'm amazed that all of you being such a professional and then doing this. I'm very bihunar, that's why I'm asking for address. Can you explain the concept of pro improvisation? And uh, how do you do that? You look at each other, if you want to improvise, give, give, give Give us, each one of you, if you don't mind, give us one or two sentences about how the improvisation comes. Uh, well, how, how, how it works in, in uh, Iranian classical music is that um, usually they don't, they don't prepare pieces ahead of the time. Um, like two or three musicians, or, uh, usually not more than two or three, but uh, go on the stage. They have some practice with each other, but they don't exactly decide what they are going to play. But they just practice on like what modes they are going to where where they are going to go, not exactly what they are going to play. Um, and then the, then they go on stage, and uh, one of them starts, and then they just follow. So they just they, they keep creating on the stage. Can you just, demonstrate that? Yeah. <laughs> 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 um, yeah, so that's how it works. Basically, one of them starts, and then they, they answer to each other. Basically, uh, on the stage, like at that moment, something comes up, uh, they play it, and then uh, the other, the other person, the singer or the other uh, uh, instrument, has to have come up with an answer, answer for this. Yeah. So they're just creating it at that moment almost. So I don't know if you guys have. From my standpoint, I want to add that you know um, it's it's very similar to jazz music here. Mm -hmm. Like you know, it, it's you know, for me, especially the drums and jazz. When I came first to the U.S., it was very fascinating. Like, you know, it, it's, it was the closest thing to for me you know, the percussion thing. So it's very uh, you know on you know as long as you're you're kind of uh, as, uh, as said, so you're responding at the same time you're coming up with your own rhythm. Sentence, if you may. So, um, so you're kind of uh, you know creating it at that moment. But the closest thing, maybe as you know, the Western audience know, is like you know when jazz uh, musicians they start to improvise, you know, and go off the rhythm and, and just continue for hours or if they want to. It's the same too, and then you're know, feeling. Just go based on your feeling. Do we know is it, which of the, is the oldest of these instruments in your culture? Probably the drum. I would yeah. say the voice. But from 
on the instrument, probably in the name. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He doesn't need to carry they it. They had tone back. The tone back was like one of the, you know, the, like your skin of an animal. You know, you have a variety of the same instruments, like in other cultures. Like that. Yeah. Before the bronze. Perfect. <laughs> so these strings are metallic, so they have to be more recent, right? And maybe you can tell us a little about the Kamon Che. Because Kamon Che, compared to anything with a Che suffix, is the diminutive. So it's a small Kamon. And Kamon is a bow. So it would be the same term we use it for a bow and arrow, would really be the same thing. Maybe you can tell us a little bit about your Kamon Che. So yeah, Kamon Che means a small bow. <coughs> small, I, I don't know why they call it Kamon Che. <laughs> uh, this is a very ancient. Viola and cello. Uh, what makes Camoncho very unique is the skin that it has. It makes the sound very unique and very easily it turned basically the vibration of this skin here. And I guess it's harder to play Camoncho. I you don't claim this, uh, other people have claimed it before. <laughs> the left hand has to hold the instrument. In violin, when you want to go to different strings, you basically move your right hand like this. The instrument is 